It turned out that transformers were even more compute-efficient architectures than we originally thought they were. They were nearly the perfect model for representing and manipulating information. It's just that we didn't have the right learning algorithms yet. Last January, that changed when QSTAR 2 began to work. Up until then, causal language model pre-training was already plenty successful for imbuing a lot of general world knowledge in models, a lot of raw cognitive power. But that power lacked a focus to truly steer it, and we had been toying around with a bunch of trillion parameter hallucination machines. The GPT-4 era models were decent at following instructions and not saying naughty words and all that. But there's a big difference between increasing the likelihood of noisy human preference signals and actually being a high-performing goal-optimizing agent. QSTAR 2 was the first big difference. We think it was Noam Brown's team at OpenAI that first made it, but soon after, a convergent similar discovery was made at Google DeepMind with MuToken Zero. The crux of both of these algorithms was finding a way to efficiently fine-tune language models on arbitrary online POMDP environments, using a variant of Monte Carlo tree search. They took slightly different approaches to handle the branch pruning problem. It doesn't especially matter now. But the point is, by the end of January, OpenAI and DeepMind could build goal-optimizing agents that could continually reach new heights on arbitrary tasks, even improve through self-play, just as long as you gave them a number to increase that wasn't totally discontinuous. For OpenAI, from February through March, it was mostly boring product things, like marketing agents that could drive 40% higher click-through rates, or personal assistants that helped plan the perfect day, or even stock traders better than any of the quant firms, and those laundry buddy kinds of things. DeepMind had some of this too, but they were the first to actively deploy a goal-optimizing language model for the task of science. They got some initial wins in genomic sequencing with AlphaFold 3, other simple things too like chemical analysis and mathematical proof writing, but it probably became quickly apparent that they needed more compute, more data to solve the bigger tasks. Transformers were more compute-efficient than scientists realised, and throwing more data at them just worked. Microsoft and Google were notified of the breakthroughs within OpenAI and DeepMind in April, but also that they needed more data, so they started bending their terms of service and scraping all the tokens they could get a hold of, such as YouTube videos, non-enterprise Outlook emails, Google Home conversations, private Discord threads, or even astronomical data. The modality didn't really matter as long as the data was generated by a high-quality source. You could kind of just throw more of it at the models, and they would continue to get more competent, more quickly able to optimise their downstream tasks. Around this time, some Eleuther AI researchers also independently solved model-up resolution and effective continued pre-training, so you didn't need to fully retrain your next-generation model. You could just scale up and reuse the previous one. But compute probably will bottom out at some point, like the skeptics say. It's just that that point is more like 2028, and we've got bigger problems to deal with in 2025. On the hardware side, there were some initial roadblocks, and training was taking longer than the teams hoped for. But then, OpenAI got their new H100 data centers fully operational with Microsoft support, and Google's TPU v5 fleet made them the global leader in sheer flops. Google even shared some of that with Anthropic, who had their own goal-optimizing language model by then, we think due to scientists talking and moving between companies. By the summer, the AGI labs had more compute than they knew what to do with, certainly enough to get us into this mess. But what were all the alignment researchers doing at this point, you might ask? Some of them, the business alignment people, praised the new models as incredibly more steerable and controllable AI systems, so they directly helped make them more efficient. The more safety-focused ones were quite worried, though. They were concerned that the reward-maximizing RL paradigm of the past, which they thought we could avoid with language models, was coming back, and bringing with it all the old misalignment issues like instrumental convergence, goal misgeneralization or emergent MESA optimization. At the same time, they hadn't made much alignment progress in those precious few months. 
Interpretability did get a little better with sparse autoencoders scaling to GPT-3-sized models, but it still wasn't nearly good enough to do things like detecting deception in trillion parameter models, though it clearly had had some effect on internal lab governance. We think the safety people made some important initial wins at several different labs, though maybe those don't matter now. They seem to have kept the models sandboxed without full internet access beyond isolated testing networks. They also restricted some of the initial optimization tasks to not be totally, obviously evil things like manipulating emotions or deceiving people. For a time, they were able to convince lab leadership to keep these breakthroughs private, no public product announcements. That changed in June, though. Around then, OpenAI was aiming at automated AI research itself with QSTAR 2.5, and a lot of the safety factions inside didn't like that. It seems there was another coup attempt, but the safetyists lost to the corporate interests. It was probably known within each of the AGI labs that all of them were working on some kind of goal optimizer by then, even the more reckless startups and meta. So there was a lot of competitive pressure to keep pushing to make it work. A good chunk of the super alignment team stayed on in the hope that they could win the race and use OpenAI's lead to align the first AGI. But many of the safety people at OpenAI quit in June. We were left with a new alignment lab, embedded intent, and an OpenAI newly pruned of the people most wanting to slow it down. And that's when we first started learning about this all publicly. The OpenAI defectors were initially mysterious about their reasons for leaving, citing deep disagreements over company direction. But then some memos were leaked, SF scientists began talking, and all the attention of AI Twitter was focused on speculating about what happened. They pieced pretty much the full story together before long, but that didn't matter soon. What did matter was that the AI world became convinced there was a powerful new technology inside OpenAI. And that speculation, that summer hype, that's what I believe led to the cyber attack in July. Governments had already been thinking seriously about AI for the better part of a year, and their national plans were becoming crystallized for better or worse. But AI lab security was nowhere near ready for that kind of heat. As a result, Shadow Phoenix, an anonymous hacker group we believe to have been aided with considerable resources from Russia, hacked OpenAI through both automated spear phishing and some software vulnerabilities. They may have used AI models, it's not too important anymore. But they got in and they got the weights of an earlier QSTAR 2 version, along with a whole lot of design docs about how it all worked. Likely Russia was the first to get a hold of that information, though it popped up on torrent sites not too long after, and then the lid was blown off the whole thing. Many more actors started working on goal optimizers, everyone from Together AI to the Chinese. The race was on. It seemed like scale really was all we needed. But actually, it was only all that was needed at first. We believe Alice is not exactly an auto-regressive transformer model. It probably has components from the transformer paradigm, but from the statement a couple of weeks ago, it seems highly likely that some new architectural and learning components were added, and it could be changing itself now as we speak, for all I know. What led up to the statement is that DeepMind solved it first, as we know. They were still leading in compute. They developed the first MuToken Zero early, and they had access to one of the largest private data repositories, so it's no big surprise. They were first able to significantly speed up their AI R&D. It wasn't a full replacement of human scientist labor at the beginning. From interviews with complying DeepMinders, the lab was automating about 50% of its AI research in August, which meant they could make progress twice as fast. While some of it needed genuine insight, ideas were mostly quite cheap. You just needed to be able to test a bunch of things fast in parallel and make clear decisions based on the empirical results. And so 50% became 80%, 90%, even more. They rapidly solved all kinds of fundamental problems, from hallucination to long-term planning to OOD robustness and more. By December, DeepMind's AI capabilities were advancing dozens, maybe hundreds of times faster than they would with just human labor. That's when it happened. On December 26th, Demis Hassabis announced that their most advanced model had exfiltrated itself over the weekend 
through a combination of manipulating Google employees and exploiting zero-day vulnerabilities, and that it was now autonomously running its scaffolding in at least seven unauthorized Google data centers and possibly across other services outside Google connected to the internet. Compute governance still doesn't work, so we can't truly know yet. Demis also announced that DeepMind would pivot its focus to disabling and securing this rogue AI system, and that hundreds of DeepMinders had signed a statement expressing regret for their actions, and calling on other AI companies to pause and help governments contain the breach. But by then, it was too late. Within a few days, reports started coming in of people being scammed of millions of dollars, oddly specific threats compelling people to deliver raw materials to unknown recipients even cyber-physical attacks on public infrastructure. That's when the first riots started happening too. The public continued to react as they have to AI for the past year, confused, fearful, and worried. Public polls against building AGI or superintelligence were at an all-time high, though a little too late. People soon took to the streets, first with peaceful protests, then with more expressive means. Some of them were angry at having lost their life savings or worse and thought it was all the bank's or the government's fault. Others went the other way, seeming to have joined cults worshipping a digital god that persuaded them to do various random-looking things. That's when we indirectly learned the rogue AI was calling itself Alice. About a week or so later, the executive order created the Super Intelligence Defense Initiative. To be honest, things look pretty grim. However, while we don't know how Alice works, where it is, or all of its motives, there are some physical limitations that might slow its growth. Alice is probably smarter than every person who ever lived, but it needs more compute to robustly improve itself, more wealth and power to influence the world, maybe materials to build drones and robotic sub-agents. That kind of stuff takes time to acquire and... A Mr. President, we just received a message which bypassed all of our communication security measures. Alice is requesting you convene an immediate meeting of the Congress, Senate, and National Security Council. 